Hey robot makers, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to control your Smiles Quad Robot using Wi-Fi, a remote control interface using Wi-Fi and a web interface and learn how I did it? Well, you're watching the right show. So come with me as we learn ro how to build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. I'll also show you some really cool fun stuff, something that one of our members suggested as well, involving Morse code. <laughs> so cool, I can't wait to show you this. So let's get over to the, uh, the keynote. And let's get started. So what is Smiles Lab? Um, so it's some remote control software that I've created. I've just demoing it um, in the intro there. So I've just got it running on an iPad here as well. I'll show you this um, in much more detail, but um, the idea is you can connect to your Raspberry Pi Zero, which is controlling your quad, and you can do stuff with it. So what is it? What can we do? How do we install it? and how, how can we use some of the components in it to, to develop this even further? And that's what the Smiles library is all about. I'm gonna show you some cool stuff with that. So what is Smiles Lab? So it's web-based remote control software for the Smiles Quad. And there's a little screenshot of it there. So it should be self-explanatory. There's three different tiles on the screen at the moment. I will build this out to even more later on. But we've got some simple remote control. So we've got an up button, a down button, a left and a right, and a center button. We have a, a stand up and a sit down. We also have clap and wiggle as just two other fun buttons I put in there. Then in the middle, there's this thing called command history. Uh, we'll have a look at what that's about. And on the right hand side is something called telemetry. And there's lots of interesting things there that we can look at later as well. So what can Smiles Lab actually do? So it enables us to control our Smiles Quad Robot over Wi-Fi. We can get the telemetry data from it. So when we plug in our range finder, we can get that data coming through. One of the things I'm going to build out shortly is a little um, like radar-like interface so we can see what distances graphically are in front of the robot. And we can also record the command history. And what I was thinking there is we could perhaps record all the, the sequence of commands that we, we record and then record the sequence of commands record and then play them back as some kind of app, as some kind of program. So it may we make it walk forward 10 paces, turn to the right, walk another 10, that kind of thing. So I've not built that into Smiles um, Lab yet, but um, you can see how we can, we can do this. And I base the idea loosely on um, the My Robot Lab idea. So if you have an in-move robot, they use uh, something that's called My Robot Lab. And I like the idea of like a robot lab, something that you can help develop your application, your robot, uh, to do what you want it to do. So 
how does all this fit together? What is it all about? So I built this using a whole bunch of different technologies. So today's show is quite lightly touching on these, um, but each of these is like an in-depth thing in itself. So if there's specific ones that you want to know more about, um, put it in the comments, let me know what you want to know more about, and we can certainly do a show delving into those. So let's start from the very bottom layer and work our way up. So we've got Raspberry Pi Zero, and we've got some servos and hardware. And by hardware, I mean one of these little PCA9685 boards. And we can plug our servos into this, one for each limb. And there's eight of them on the Smiles Quad, one for the foot and one for the leg. And we've got four legs. Um, so that's what we mean by hardware. Then there's a driver from Adafruit, a Python driver, that enables us to just send it some pulse width modulation signals and it will move the servos. Uh, then we have Python 3 on top of that. On top of that is something that's called Smiles Library, which is a Python library that I've written. Uh, we'll delve into that in a lot more detail. And then on top of that stack, because that's not that's just um, it provides basic functionality for the robot, uh, we've then got Smiles Lab, which is the the APIs, the, um, the interface, everything that uses Smiles Library. And then there's something that's called Flask, which is a web framework that enables us to create these APIs, these application programming interfaces. We have one for controls and we have one for um, metrics. Um, I think there's another one as well for command history, but it's quite a light one. Then on top of that is the actual interface itself, which uses Bootstrap, which is a common CSS and HTML framework for developing websites. Um, so you can see there on the left hand side, yeah, the Python is what we've written all this code in. Smiles library is a Python library, which I've coded um, to make building more Smiles quad robots easier. So I can put all the functionality in there, kind of hide it away. And then I've got some really nice, easy commands that we can build into other applications as well. Flask is used to develop the interactive website. So um, I can show you a bit of that if you're interested, but um, it can be quite in depth that. And then APIs, I've got a couple of them. Uh, and we've got a tool that we can probe the API and test things out. So that's uh, an interesting thing. So that's called Postman. That's a new tool I can show you today. So PyPy, Pied Piper. So PyPy, if you've not heard of this before, this is the official source of all third party libraries. So if you go to python.org, you'll see at the very top there, it'll say PyPy and it's the Python library. Um, and this is what pip uses. Pip is the Python package manager. You might have used pip to install different packages. So if you want to install the Adafruit PCA9685 driver, you can use pip install PCA and blah, blah, blah. So I've created a Smiles library and it's hosted on PyPy. So it's very easy to get these things submitted. You just create an account. Um, you just have to go through a process of setting up your library. So it has certain files in it and then you upload them. And then it goes, all oh, right, there's a new version available and then it just publishes that available. So to install Smiles library, and you can do this if you want today, you can just do pip install smiles library or smiles underscore library, it doesn't matter which one. And you will get Smiles library, which is one of the, the building blocks of Smiles lab. So PyPy, really cool. So demo time, let's have a look at this Smiles library and have a see what we can actually do with it. So um, I'm gonna break out now to, let me just go to me for a second while I get the right screen up. So let's have a think, let's go over to, let's try this one, I'm just gonna quit that. Okay, so if I come over to here, so I'm on a Raspberry Pi Zero, this is the actual Raspberry Pi, which is running on, um, let me just go to the right screen here running on this white robot here. So that Raspberry Pi Zero, I've just got it loosely. It will go actually inside there, just like we have on that one there. But uh, this is my prototype model, which I use for sort of developing things. So, um, so that's the one that we're actually connected to here. And hopefully you can see that. I might zoom in a bit on the, uh, the old text so you can see a bit better. So Command, Shift and Plus, I think that is. Okay, there we go. That should be a little bit bigger. Right, so what we'll do is, um, I'm already inside the virtual environment, but I'll take you through how we can do this from scratch, if you like, just so that um, you understand. So I'm just gonna deactivate this environment. Activate. Um, what I'm gonna do is just step out of this folder, create a brand new one that we just call test. Let's go into test. And to create a new virtual environment, you have to do Python 3 dash M to run a module. And then you have to say you want a virtual environment and I'm gonna call this virtual environment VM as well. So if I do that, it'll take a couple of seconds to grab all the files from um, Python online, 
the late I think actually is it the, the um, it might be the local version not the, the online version so it'll grab them it'll actually build out a new installation of Python 3 in this virtual environment and that means that anything that we do in that environment just touches that one sandbox so it doesn't destroy anything else it's running on a Raspberry Pi Zero so it is a little bit slow um, but once it's done that we can have a play with I, I might even quit out this one I just wanted to show you how I did this um, I'll just give it another couple of seconds. There we go, we've done it. So then what we do is we type in source, and this is the command that's going to enable us to activate that virtual environment. And so if I just type venv and then tab, it'll automatically complete the, um, the command line for me. So inside there's a bin, a binary folder, and then there's a, a script that's called activate. And now that I've done that, you'll see that it's got this venv in brackets. So that means that we're now in that virtual environment. So if I type in Python, it's actually going to run Python 3. 3.7.3 which must be the version that's on here so I'm just going to quit out for a second I'm going to do pip install and then I'm just going to upgrade the version of pip that's on here because it always complains about that it always says that you're on version 20 and you need version 21 something like that so this will go out to the internet it will grab the latest version and pull it down from PyPy um, so on this Raspberry Pi I have got it connected to the internet so I've got a little uh, Wi-Fi connection there um, but once you've installed these, you can disconnect from the internet. You don't need to be uh, connected once you've got the files on there. But obviously, if you wanted to do Wi-Fi control, you do need Wi-Fi on there. So it's just looking through pipi.org. Um, it's going to pull down the latest version of PIP and then install it for us. So it just does take a little bit of a, a time because it's a Raspberry Pi Zero. I have also been developing this on a Raspberry Pi 4, and it's obviously a lot quicker. And on the Mac M1, it's just instantaneous. So... <laughs> It's just the connection to the web that takes any time at all there. So we're on version 18. We should now be on version 21.1.2, I think it says there. Uh, and it just needs to uninstall the old version first. Once it's done that, we can then install the SMARS library. And the SMARS library does have a few dependencies of its own, but they're all taken care of. You don't have to worry about that. It brings them in as we install it. Right, so now that that's installed, we can now do install SMARS. Oops. Smiles or lowercase library. So I use I always use the underscore, but I think you actually can use the dash. So pip install smiles library. I think that's all we need to do. So it's going to connect to PyPy again. It's going to download that version. It might even look that it's got it cached locally and install it from there. No, but it's actually gone online to find the latest version, which is good. So on about 1.8 are we now, I think. So it's, it's included there, the Adafruit PCA9685 driver, for example, uh, Adafruit GPIO, um, what else is it installed there? A couple of other bits and pieces that we need, SPI dev, and so on. Right, so we're in there. So if I now type Python, I'm just going to the, the REPL command shell, we can now do um, from SMARS library. Now the way that this is embedded, you actually have to type it twice, library, because it's within that. Import smars robot as SR. I'm just going to call it SR for short. Okay. So now if I do a new variable called quad and I say SR, it's now going to create a new robot, which is our smars robot. So now we can get this smiles robot to do some things. So what I'm going to do first of all um, is I'm going to get it to identify which limbs are connected. Because one of the first things you want to do when you built your robot is check, have you got all the limbs connected to the right servo things? So I've created a thing that's called identify. So if I just do the word identify, and then you provide the channel number for it. So if we just say zero to begin with, what it will actually do, if I go to this view here, um, it should start to wiggle this limb. Just uh, move that one out of the way. It should start to move this limb when I press. Um, let's just move that up a bit so we can see it return. So let's see if it's going to do that. Oops, what put on the wrong there? I've typed identify wrong, haven't I? Ident identify, identify. There we go. Um, what put on wrong there? Da -da -da, channel. So do, we need, do I need to just do channel? Let me just type this again. Zero. Okay. What for Don Kevin equals one. I had this work in a second ago. <laughs> what have I done wrong there? Why am I doing this wrong? Uh, ah, it's because I'm doing SR. I'm calling the actual class. It should be quad. Quad.identify. 
sorry about that and then zero right so let's watch this limb here so that's going to wiggle ever so slightly i could hear it moving i can see it moving it's not moving a lot it's running off a nine volt battery at the moment so we're not getting a lot of action there um, but i can tell that it's actually that limb it's the front left leg so it's this servo in here that's actually moving so if i now change that to a one it should now be this foot and it'll sort of tap the foot a little bit so we know that that's the correct one and it says on the screen there left front left foot front we now do channel two it's now this back leg which is the uh, left back leg if we change that to number four sorry number three it should be now this foot here which is the um, left back foot yep there we go it's giving a bit of a wiggle and so on so if we do that it's now going to wiggle this this one on the other side here which is the leg and then number five so again if i'm taking another robot and i've not actually used the code before this is a, the perfect way to actually check the configuration another way that we can do this instead of using the identify is we can type config what that will do is just return loads of text but this is actually um, a dictionary of all the settings so we can see there that the name is left foot front <laughs> left foot front the channel is number one it's not inverted we'll look at what that means later on the minimum angle is 50 and the maximum angle is 150 uh, and then the next one the name is left foot back that's on channel three so they're not all in sequential order in how they're stored and that doesn't really matter as long as that they are assigned to the correct channel so this is some of the things that we can do within the smars library we can use this on the um, in the repl we can build blocks on top of this uh, and i'll show you something really cool as well shortly but let's just get back to the, the slides uh, and we'll talk about some extra cool stuff which is about documentation i didn't realize it could do this and it's so cool so how do you get help on doc on um, any any documentation in python so you can either tell you can either type help and then in brackets the name of the class or function that you're interested in but how do you write your own help well it turns out that all you need to do is just create one of these doc strings you put three sorry three speech marks then some text that describes what your function does and then another three speech marks that's all you need to do python will do the rest if you type in help and then that function name it will return that doc string and there is um if the more that you put in that doc string the more help it will provide to your users and it turns out there's loads of extra stuff you can do with this so i'm going to show you um pydoc which is the help system for python um, so you can see on the left oh, sorry on the right there um, they've got a class definition so there's a module doc string which is at the very top there's a class one so it always comes underneath either the class name the uh, function name so we've got my method there's a doc string there uh, or just another regular uh, function there so it's always the one just underneath the definition okay so like i said the uh, the help system is built on this pi doc uh, and at the REPL you can actually type in help so let's just have a look at that we'll come back to that slide in a second actually let's um let's just do that so if i type in help and just brackets it'll just bring up the python help system so um, it's just having a look um, to see what modules are installed i think it has to do that the first time you type help doesn't normally take this long grief there we go so we've got some help welcome to the python 3.7 help utility so i'm just going to come out of that i'm going to type in uh, so do i just need to type quit there we go uh, so if i type in help and then smars library look what it's going to do what's it what have i done wrong there smars library dot actually we can type in quad which is the name of our little robot that uses that class and look it's brought up some help there help on smars robot in the module smars library smars library object so the class is called smars robot um, and it says this is used to model the robot its legs and its sensors methods are defined here and we've got backwards um, we've got some parameters in there if i scroll down we've got body which is another command that we can type if i scroll down so this isn't great if you want to view the um the documentation and, and browse through this is more designed if you have a particular question in mind that you want to answer so let's go back to uh here for a second so this REPL help um helps us quickly get answers to things that we you know we're diving into but it runs on this pydoc which is a, a library that's been developed to to 
go through your code, find these doc strings and then build indexes of them. Well, it turns out this PyDoc can do a lot more than that. It can actually host a server for all your documentation. So what I'll do, just so that we're not uh, waiting on the Raspberry Pi, um, I'll actually run it from here. So if I type in, um, let's see, Py Python and then PyDoc, and then I'm actually going to launch um, a server. So if I type in, I think it's B and sorry, P for port, and then I'm just going to type four eights for. Um, so what can't it do? Py doc, ah, dash M for module. You have to include the dash M. So now it says server commands browser or quit. If I press B for browser, it's now going to launch um, a web browser. So it's launched Safari, which must be my default browser. Let's just move this so we can see it. And um, we've got this very colorful documentation browser. So we can see all the built-in modules. We can see um, everything else that's installed on here. And you can sort of delve into these and just read all the documentation, just like we have previously on the REPL, but this is a little bit easier and you can actually search for things as well. So I'm gonna back out of this. Uh, well, I'm just gonna quit actually. I'm gonna quit from here. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to deactivate this. I'm going to go into, because uh, that was just something I was looking at previously. Let me go into Smars Lab. And let's just activate that with the source bin activate. And then let's do that same thing again. So Python dash M PyDoc um, P for port and then 888. Um, what if I I typed in that. Let's just do Python 3 and then B for browser. Okay, now this time, because I've got some third party modules installed, such as um, the SMARS library, it can actually detect that they're there. So if I go into that SMARS lab, and then I go into SMARS library, here's a much more easy to read documentation suite and it's built this just from the doc strings that I put in the code so you can see there there's something that's called command history you can read all about how, what things it needs its parameters if it returns any values I've had to type this all in this isn't just for free um, but it makes it a lot easier to actually identify how to use stuff so for example look at a leg object so our robot is made up of an array of legs um, and we can set the leg to a body position which we can try out in a second. We can set it to a default. We can make it go down or up. We can make it identify, which is what we did a minute ago to make it wiggle. We can set it to a middle position, which is halfway between up and down, it says there, or the minimum and maximum value. We can get it to show some debug info. We can make it stretch, go to a swing position, which is kind of like an X position. And we can make it do tick and untick, which is part of the walking forwards and backwards. And then we can do up, which makes it stand up. And it says there are a few other things in here, such as angle, channel, invert, leg, min, leg, max, and name, the name of the robot. And we're going to play with that in a minute as well. So this is really cool. I didn't even know that this existed. Um, and I wanted to share that with you because you can develop some quite good documentation. And you can even get it to generate those files as standalone HTML files just by doing dash W and then the name of the module that you want to create the documentation for. So that's a really useful thing to know if you don't know that already. So the SMARS library provides this, for, this core functionality to the SMARS quad robot. Um, so it's made up of the leg class and also the robot class as well. So the robot class kind of encapsulates the, the leg um, I call it the leg class. It really should have been called the limb class because it's a foot or it's a leg. It doesn't matter which. It just models the servo and has things like the minimum and maximum angle that the servos need to have. And if you watch back on the video that I created that was um, about how to make the SMARS quad robot walk, it was a Python uh, tutorial I did many, many months ago, probably nearly a year ago. Um, that has a lot more depth about all the details that... Um, of how you know what what all the settings are why we'd have a minimum maximum angle what the invert is all about and so on so we've had a quick look at um the PyDoc and the identify stuff we've already done that i jumped the gun a little bit there because i was so excited to show you that so we can skip over that bit and then we can talk about apis so with smiles lab i was thinking about how can i make this as interactive as possible and as useful as possible uh, and one of the ways I thought to make it really extensible was to use APIs. So rather than just locking everything into um, a standard web page with 
static pages that come up if you click a button it refreshes the page that wouldn't really work very well particularly on a raspberry pi zero that's quite laggy anyway so what i've done is i've um, i've developed some apis but let's have a look what apis actually are first before we get into that so it's a way of sending and receiving information data in a standard way typically uses json which is that javascript object notation it's little squiggly brackets and then you've got values in speech marks you've got a little colon and then sort of the key and the, the value pairs and uh, yes, um, somebody's saying that JSON and REST are a great combination, very flexible. So they call these RESTful interfaces, representational, representational state transfer. Uh, what that means is it's actually a stateless interface. You don't have to care what state, you don't have to remember what state it's in, you just fire commands and get data back. Um, so it's very nice and easy to program, very clean. You don't have to you get your knickers in a twist with what state things are in. You can just ask for particular states and it will tell you what state things are in. So nice and simple to do uh, and I built it using something called Flask which is a Python web application framework similar to Django not as complicated as Django but it's very extensible very well regarded in the Python community so I built that quite a while ago so let's have a look at what we can do with um, APIs so there's a tool that's called Postman I shall show you Postman uh, momentarily and it's a way to test APIs to, to get data um, and set data and then what we essentially do is we get and post data so get data just says give me this and post is here is some data you can also do things like delete patch there's a whole bunch of them uh, we don't need to worry about that we're simply just getting data and maybe sending a few commands to our robot so the api in smars lab uh, is set it, it's real time so we can get real time data about what the angles are doing you know what the servos what angle they're at and so on and have that refresh in the page within that component without having to refresh the entire page so it'll just update that particular component we can have a look at how that works shortly so if we press a button um, to make the robot walk forward the up button what that actually does is just sends a, a control command via the control api um, and that will then act upon that. Uh, we can get the telemetry data to see you know, what the angles the, um, the servos are all at by just getting some data from the metrics API. And the command history, which was that middle one, that one is just a list of all the commands that we pressed so far. And that's accessed through the command history API, which just has one job just to send you all the different commands. There is two parts of that. You can even do like the top 10 commands that have been, or you can get the entire history. But there's a, a picture of uh, Postman um, there. But we're going to have a look at Postman and have a quick demo of that as well. So let me just pull up Postman, get this ready for you to look at. And there we go. So if I now jump back to here. So this is Postman. It's a free piece of software. I think it works on Windows, Macs. Um, not, I'm not sure if it works on Linux, but it's all open source. So um, you should be able to download that for free and start using it. Um, Gets a, takes a bit of getting used to, I guess, as all tools do, but it's pretty simple. So what we have here is we have the kind of command that we want to issue. So you can do get or post. They're the main two that we're going to use. There is all these other ones that we don't need to worry about. But essentially, we're going to get data or we're going to, or we're going to post data. And post, that's why it's called postman. Um, they were just a play on words there. So then we need to send it a URL. So we need to get the data from a URL. So I'm going to use this 127.0.0.1 which is my local machine. So if I jump over to, let's see, let me just bring down um, this here, which is Smars Lab. I'm just gonna run it on my local machine. So if I just, um, let's have a see, let's try that. There we go, so that's now launched on our local machine. So if I now go back to Postman, I should be able to post some data and get some data back. So I want to get the command history. So to begin with, we shouldn't have any command history. This data down here is from a previous run. So if I press send, if all is going to work well, it's going to send that command command to the API and it's got some data back that says new history. So we haven't sent any commands to our history. And what I've done along the side here is just created some shortcuts to so these URLs and the, the keys that we might need to set or the parameters that we need to set. So if I go to telemetry, um, I've got a key there that's called metric and the value is telemetry. So if I send that to the metrics API and the port 5000 is from the um, when we started this up, it's picked port 5000. 
Um, we looked at ports in one of the previous um, videos. Um, so if you're wondering what that's to do with, look at the video that talks about OSI stacks uh, and it's on there. And Hybotic says you can also call your system local host. Absolutely. Uh, that'll work just as well. So if you don't want to call it uh, 127, let's change that to local host just to prove that works. And what we'll do is we'll send that and then we'll get back some data. So we've got back a JSON object, uh, which is what these squiggly brackets are and square brackets. So we've got the key and then we've got the value. So the left leg front is zero. So at the moment, everything's at zero. We haven't got any other data back from that just yet. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to send it the up command, which will actually make it walk forward. So if I press send on that one, it says, OK, if we now go back to our command history, run that again. We've now got a new command that says up. And in fact, if I go over to um, let me just uh, bring up a web browser that's got the correct address on. So localhost 5000. Let's go back over to that. So you can see here that we have. Um, so because I'm running this on a Mac that hasn't got the um, PCA 968 driver board installed, it comes up with this message that I've given you, which is nice and friendly that says um, the driver isn't loaded and you can click on this documentation link to get more information about that. But what we're interested in here is we're interested in the telemetry. So we've actually got some telemetry now and we've also got a new, the command that we, we, we sent to it via postman, which is up, which is exactly the same. If we press that button, that's what that will do. If I press that there, we'll get another up appearing on there. Did I actually press it then? Yep, there we go, up. And we could see, if you watch quickly, you'll see that these angles change in real time. So I'm just going to press some buttons and you'll see them sort of change in real time. So I'm going to press down and I'm going to press home. I'm going to call clap, wiggle, stand up, sit down, and then back again. So you can see all these things are changing. Let's go back over to Postman. Let's now send to our command history. And you can see there the complete list of command history that we've, uh, that we've grabbed there because we're actually looking at the same data. This is just how we access it. So we can do, again, more things like we can make the robot move left by sending the left command. So the command go into the control API and the value is left. Um, so you have to know what these commands are to use the API. Um, that, that's something that I would have to document if I wanted people to use that too. But this is specific to SMARS Lab. This isn't part of SMARS Library. This is built upon SMARS uh, Library. So and then there's another command there, which is shut down server. So if I send that, it's going to say server shutting down. And in fact, if we go over to Visual Studio Code, it's now got the shutdown command and it's quit that. And in fact, if I go over to the Safari and I refresh that page, you can see now that that's, that's uh, no longer connecting to that. So there we go. So that's uh, Postman. That's some of the, the very few things that you can do with it. You can do a hell of a lot more with it. You can record a lot of um, your steps for your API and you can test them out. Um, but I chose this because we can get that those different components to to um, work independently of each other. So you can press the up, you'll get the telemetry back, you'll see the command history update, and it isn't doing anything else on the uh, the interface. It's just those one that those individual components that are updating. So how do we do that? That's um, the magic of something that's called AJAX. It's, it's getting old, that definition of AJAX. It stands for asynchronous, meaning not at the same time, JavaScript and XML. And it's not really XML. Nobody really uses that anymore. <laughs> people might do in industry because they've invested so much in it, but most people use JSON now, which is this JavaScript object notation, which we've just seen. So jQuery, um, you can grab the jQuery um, J, uh, JSON files from the web. Um, it's all open source. Uh, and you just stick some similar kind of code to this at the top of your web page and you can get it to basically build out um, a section of your document tree um, by looking at some data. So let's have a quick look what happens here. So we've got a thing that's called commands. That's a variable and that's getting it from this command history. And then this Ajax thing is going to be the, the part that builds out our page down here. So. It's a type post. Remember, where we, we, we post information or we can get it. So we're actually going to send some information there. We are going to um, look at the URL that's called command history. Uh, and then the type that, we, that we're going to I'm sending it some data. And what I'm, I'm sending it is list type and it is going to be of type 
top 10. And what I mean by that is just give me the top 10 list of history commands rather than the entire list. Because if I've been using this for a while and I've got thousands of commands, I might only want to be interested in the top 10, the last top 10. So if it's successful, then it will say um, append. So it's going to append it to this section that we've called uh, command history. Um, and it's going to do some HTML there. Oops. So I didn't mean to uh, press that. Let me just jump back. Um, so da, da, da. there we go. So I was just reading it. I actually clicked it. I didn't mean to do that. Um, so yeah, TR is a table row. TD is table data. And code is just... Um, it means a block of code. So this is just HTML. And then in the middle of that is the command that we've just grabbed from that. So for each command that we get back in that list, we want to put that in our table uh, that we display on the screen. So I'm going to show you how that actually works in the background in a second, because uh, the next thing is Smart Lab demo. So let's go back out to, to me for a second. Let me bring up, um, I need to start Smart Lab again. So let's go back over to to here, let's start that just by doing up arrow. I'll run it on the Mac because it's obviously a lot quicker there. We can go back to Safari and then just refresh. And here we go. Let me just. One of the bugs I've got on here at the moment is you can see these buttons are not sticking to the inside of that. And that's because I use tables to arrange everything, which you don't use tables, use divs. Uh, but this is a couple of years ago that I actually developed this. OK, so we can see there we've got no commands, we've got no telemetry coming through. So let's just press that home button there so that it sets the servos to some kind of default position. Um, so let's have a look in the the source, the page source to see what's going on. So in here, there should be some JavaScript, um, which there it is. Um, so this says when we click um, a button, um, da, 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 da. Let me have a look to see. So when we click button, um, it's going to get some result. So if you press the up button, it's going to send through the up command. So that's essentially what that's doing there. Get JSON up. Um, so when I press that up button there, that's essentially what's happening. It's calling the API. The API is responding and saying, and it actually makes the robot move forwards by calling the move forwards command. Um, and we can have a look in the, the source code to see how this works in the background as well. And you can see there on this screen, it's updating every couple of seconds. I think I've got this to just check every second at the moment. Um, you could make it more, but then there's a lot more load on the machine. So it's just sending out the, the command history and the metrics API every second. Um, so let's have a look in Smart Lab itself. Let's just move this down and then let's just make this a bit bigger so we can see what's going on. And let's have a look at how this works. So some of this is Flask. Um, so if this blows your noggin, don't worry about this. Um, you have to understand how Flask works to be able to sort of read this. But I'm going to show you one of the APIs. I'll just show you this one to begin with just because it's easy to understand. Oops. So um, let me just zoom in a bit. Let's just close out that file explorer. We don't need that. So web pages. Um, uh, like a tree. So the URL builds up from the, the, the root. So the root here is this forward slash. Uh, and what we're seeing here, app.root is a Flask command that says, if you want to access the, the root, then do whatever is in this function. So it's going to bring in the telemetry information. It's going to say telemetry, which will, you can see there, the nice document string that we've got back, which uh, just gets the current telemetry. It's a dictionary of all those different, well, a list of all those different um, servos and what value they currently are. And it says if the driver is true, um, then you, you can flash a me message up there. That seems to be back to front that anyway. And then what it does is renders the template. The template is called index.html uh, and it returns that rendered template to the application, which is Flask. So if we had a look at that template just for a second to see if we can understand anything that's going on in there. So let me just find, um, let me just, that's open. We don't want that. We want, we want the actual folder structure. So there is two different folder structures with Flash. You have static and you have templates. So if we'll have a look in templates and at the index to HTML, um, it has these little blocks um, of code in squiggly brackets. Now this isn't standard HTML or CSS. This is, um, 
to do with flask and how it handles it. It's actually something called ginger. Um, so if you ever use handlebar or moustache, these work in the similar ways. And it's because of that little thing, it looks like a little moustache just sort of on the side. Um, and what that does is it replaces whatever is in this content with some, um, some other content because this is a template for it. So it's got a block there called navbar and then it says end block navbar and then it's got a block called content. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, it's replacing whatever's in the content with this piece here. So we can see there we're bringing in the Ajax um, from Google, Google APIs. So I'm just getting the latest, well, version 1.9.1 of jQuery. It may be well out of date now that one, but it still works. Um, and then further down here, I'm just trying to find the bit where we actually replace some of the, um, yeah, there's an example. So we can see there that an image, um, it says URL for, which is a flask thing, static file name image telemetry. So that little telemetry icon that we have over here, let's just go close that out. That little symbol there is being provided by that little URL for. So there's quite a lot of different technologies working together here and it can be a bit confusing about what's going on, but there's a whole technology stack. Um, we've got SMARS library sat at the reasonably bottom of that SMARS library providing some basic functionality about the robot and modeling that and handling all the commands as they get sent through. We have Flask providing the web user interface and then we have the APIs through Flask again, which can send and receive the commands when we press these buttons. I'm using jQuery to actually query those APIs to get some data and then populate this screen. And I just use Bootstrap on top of that to uh, to, to show what's going on. Um, so let's have a look. So Hypotix is saying, rather than use a global variable, wouldn't it be better just to return the telemetry? Probably. Um, when I wrote this code, my Python experience was probably only about a year at that point. So I knew the language, but I wasn't really using it very well. It's weird that you have to bring in global variables anyway. I find that quite a weird concept. You don't normally do that in coding. You just, yeah, you, you don't use global variables. It's sort of a bad idea. That's exactly what uh, Hypotix is saying there. Okay, so let me just jump back to our slides. Um, was there anything else I needed to show you on Smart Lab? I'll actually show you it running. That's probably a good idea, isn't it? So if I go back to, um, let's go back to that Raspberry Pi. Uh, let's make sure that we're actually running it on here. So let's quit that and let's come out of test deactivate test. Let's go into Smiles Lab. So this is on the Raspberry Pi that's connected to the, uh, the robot. And let's actually run, so we need to do source again. So vm bin activate, then Python Smiles Lab oop.py. Okay. And it's Python, not Python. There we go. Let's try that. And it'll fire up. Um, the whole stack and you'll see it build it up. So initializing robots, that's the SMARS library um, robot being created. And then this is all Flask um, stuff there. It says it's running on a development server. It says you can connect to that address there, 0.0.500, which is just local host really. Um, initializing robot again means that um, it's created that SMARS thing and then this debugger pin is if you have an error while you're running this development software, you can type in that pin number and then actually execute code through the web interface, which is very dangerous if that's exposed to the World Wide Web. But we're running this uh, a local network. So that means that we're actually connected now. If I go back to um, here and instead of going to localhost, if I just type in the name of that server, which that the Raspberry Pi, I think it's 207. Um, and then it, that message should disappear. There we go, because we've actually got a live robot running. So let's go to this view again here. I'll just squish this down a bit so that we can see what's going on. Oops, that one there even. Right, so I'm going to press the stand up button. So we should see this robot stand up when I press that. And we've got the stand command there. And we should also get some telemetry through shortly. I don't know why it hasn't done that yet. If I press this one here, which is the home button, that's just going to set everything to roughly its middle position. Some of them um, are not 90 degrees because that's not halfway between the minimum and maximum angle. Um, I'm also going to get it to turn left. 
Now, one of the challenges I've got here is that this is on a very slippy desk, so it doesn't grip very well. Plus, because I've got this actually wired up to, um, I've not got it on battery only, uh, the wire is actually pulling it back a little bit. So that might affect its ability to, to sort of perform today. So I'm going to press back now. I'm just going to walk backwards. Let's do it a few times like that. One of the other challenges I've got is uh, these are not actually um, glued into place. This one, these are all solidly glued in and all the wires are nice. This is my prototype one and it does get battered quite a bit. Um, so that's uh, backwards, forwards, turn left, right. If I do clap now, it kind of does a funny little clap motion. If I do wiggle, it does like a little swim action. Um, now we can also press the setup button. And what I'm intending to do here, let's just go back to um, full screen actually. Let's just bring this back up here. Oops, that one here. What I'm intending to do here so I've got a picture of that PCA9685 board and I've got all these buttons here and I want to use this, that identify function, I built that so that when you click one of these buttons, it will identify each of those limbs because it might be that you've not wired it correctly. And I was even, I've even put functionality in the Smarts library so you can reconfigure which of these, these ports that you're connected to on the PCA9685 board and reconfigure it on the fly. And you can see there on the step two, it says the servos have a range of motion between zero and 80. However, the robot's leg might not need to go that far because it's got a little head that can fit on there. This might actually only swing to about 10 degrees and it might go all the other way to about 90 degrees. Whereas on this one, it goes from 180 to 90. And that's what we have that invert for because if it's inverted, we don't want it to go from zero to 90 on here because it'll it'll smash into that side there and only go as far as here. So we need to have some way of identifying which orientation the servo is in. And it's because it's actually the opposite way round. Sort of left to right rather than right to left. Um, so Hypotics, I'm going to read through your comments in a minute. This is some really good stuff you put in here. I want to, uh, to take this on board. So I'm going to have a quick look at that in a second. So then the about button is just, um, you know, takes you gives you a bit of information about Smiles Lab, like you can go to the GitHub library there, you can download the code, and have a play with it yourself. Um, so it's all open source, I've gifted that to everyone, you can go to Smiles Fan as well from there. So there we go. And we can also shut down the server. So if I press that, it's now shut down the server. We saw that uh, function in the background before. So if I now go back over to that Raspberry Pi, you can see there that it's exited out. Okay, so that's the demo. That's it, the robot actually doing some stuff. Now, Adam suggested something. Um, how long ago was it, Adam? A couple of weeks ago, you said, wouldn't it be really cool if the, the quad robot tapped out with its foot Morse code? So when I was fixing a bug, there was a bug in the walking code where it just wouldn't walk properly. It just did some really weird things. Uh, and it's because I'd renamed something and not updated it throughout the code. And um, while I was in the area of code, I thought, how hard would it be to make a piece of code that taps out Morse code? Let's have a look at that and then let's have a play with that code, shall we? Right, so, yeah, Adam says, don't know, ages ago. <laughs> At least ages ago. <laughs> so let's have a look on um, Visual Studio. Uh, let's go over to Smars Library, actually. So let's just open up that code. And let's have a play with that. So what's involved in making it tap out Morse code? So the very basics, the foot is going to go down and the foot is going to go up. And we're going to have some kind of Morse code string that we pass to it, just text that we pass to it, and it's going to convert that string into Morse code. So to be able to convert it, we need to type out, yes, I had to do this. Where's my piece of paper? So I had to sit there and type out all Morse code <laughs> into a dictionary because then we can go through that dictionary and find each letter and then get what the, the characters are for that. So for example, if I wanted to type out my name, it would be dash dot dash, then it'd be dot, and then it would be dot 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 dash, then it'd be dot dot, and then it would be dash dot. So that is just a simple dictionary that has a list of all the different key values. So the letter and then what the dot dash combination is for that. Now there are different lengths, so we need to handle that. So if we go to Smiles Library now, and let's have a look at the code for uh, tapping out messages. So if I just scroll down on here, I should be able to find it. it's in the Smiles robot. There we go, tap message. Right, so it's surprisingly nice to be able to do this in code. 
So we pass a message as a parameter and the message is just going to be like hello world. It might have spaces in it. It might have funny characters. We need to get rid of anything that's kind of an illegal Morse code character. Uh, so the first thing we do is we convert whatever's in message to lowercase because there is no such thing as uppercase in Morse code that I know of. And then for each character in that message, we're going to say, is, is it in that Morse alphabet? If it's not, if it's, if it's not in there and it's not the um, space character, then print the message, sorry, the character, and then provide whatever character it is. It isn't part of Morse code. Please try again and return false. However, if it does work, we can then say, right, let's prepare our robot. So the first thing we need to do is make the foot go. It says up. That actually means put the foot down. It makes, makes the robot body go up. That was my thinking at the time, which is upside down, really. And then for each character in the message, uh, we're going to say, again, this is probably bad code. That should probably sit just above that for loop there. But the dot is going to be 0 0.175. That's just how long it's going to take to do a dot before it does the next character. A dash is going to be a bit longer than that, so half a second. Um, and we just set the thing that's called duration to zero to begin with. And then if the character is space, we're going to wait for a second and a half just to delineate that there's a space between um, the character between the words. OK, so if it's not a space, this is the bit that does the actual work. So for dot dash and dot dashes, as it's working its way through our um, our message, it's going to say, right, so I've got the letter A. I've looked in the dictionary. A is whatever A ends up being dot dash. So dot dash um, in the alphabet. If it's a dot, then the duration gets set to dot, which is 0 0.175. And we just print out the dot just so that we know we've done that. If it's a dash, then we set the duration to dash, which is half a second. And then we sleep for that half second. Um, and then we we put the foot up, which actually puts <laughs> it puts the robot up, puts the foot down, and then it puts the foot up, and then puts the foot down, and it does it for the duration that we've set there. So, so Richard says, have we test? Can we get this tested? Um, absolutely, we're going to test this out. Absolutely, we are. So that's the code. It simply just reads through the message that you provide, and then for each character in that string, it will then look in the dictionary and then work its way through the result of that. If it's a dot, it will do it a particular amount of time. If it's a dash, it will do the um, put the foot down for a particular amount of time as well. So it's kind of the spaces in between that we're counting rather than the, um, the foot itself. Right. So what, one of the things I thought, so I built this one. It works. So you can type it out. And then I thought when you change the name of a robot, we could also make it tap out the new name as well in Morse code. But let's try this out, shall we? Let's go back over to our... Raspberry Pi Pico. Let's fire up Smars Lab. Oh, actually, not Smars Lab. Let's quit, 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 quit. Let's do Python, and then let's um, from Smars Library because this is actually isn't in Smars Lab yet. This is just part of the library. And then um, import Smars Robot as SR, and then quad equals oops. What equals SR. Now it'll say initializing robot. Right, so now we can do quad. So let's type um, I can boogie as the string and let's get our thing at the ready so we can see it do this and hopefully be able to hear it tap the table as well. <laughs> what have I done wrong there? So I've not typed in tap message. I've done that wrong again. Tap message. So keen to type this in. There we go. So it's doing its dots and its dashes. I'm going to get it to sit down in a second and you'll hear it a lot more because it sort of thunders as it does it. So if we do um, uh, quad dot sit. Oh, maybe stand. It's having a bit of a fit there. There we go. Right, let's try that again. So instead of I can boogie, I'll just do um, Kev. Let's try. Uh, what I need it to do is sit down a little bit. Let's try and sit and then let's try tap the message out. There we go. Tapping a bit more now. <laughs> okay. 
And our SOS is the easiest one to, to hear because it's, uh, is it dot, dot, dash, dash, dot, dot? <laughs> like so. So if we change the name of the quad robot, so we say name equals um, Robbie. It's now going to type Robbie out its foot. <laughs> so cool. So what I was thinking was, I've not done this yet, but I, I may well do this. This um, microbit robot, which is also a quad, it has a microphone on it. And one of the things you can get it to do is listen to large sounds, you know, large spikes of sound. So I reckon I could reverse that so that it can listen to these taps and then present what it hears, you know, what it sees on its display. Not done this yet. That's a, another cool thing we could do. <laughs> so the robots could actually talk to each other through Morse code. The, the, unfortunately, the uh, Raspberry Pi Zero doesn't have a built-in microphone, but I'm sure we could shove one on there so, <laughs> so that they could talk to each other in Morse code. Because why not? <laughs> Who needs Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when you've got Morse code? So this is just so much fun. There's so many things like that you can do with it. Um, so yeah, I think that's um, what I wanted to show you with the Morse code. Is that everything? So yeah, I just put on there about the walking cycle. This was just an appendix slide, really. Um, if you was interested to know how on earth the robot walks forward, it's quite a convoluted um, process to get all the different limbs to move. Now you can get them all to move without any kind of delay, but I created this really convoluted tick system where it, you would set the angle where you want it to be and then over the fullness of time it would reach there and the time would be configurable um, so you get a lot more smoother motion so instead of it just going like one limb try and demonstrate this like one limb and then another limb all the limbs move at the same time in a sort of fluid motion so to do that I needed to figure out what the um, the walking cycle would be uh, and then for each of the limbs you know the feet and the legs um, there's four major steps to that which you can see on there and each limb is moved at some point um, so you have to move the foot up move the body um, and move the front leg to the body and the the right front foot sorry right, like right front leg to the stretch position now some of the some of them are down because if it's down it will actually move the body whereas if it's up it'll just move the foot and um, it's quite a complicated thing to explain it's much easier to actually just try it out yourself in code so yeah so let's have a look at uh, <laughs> what people have been saying here while i've been doing this so let's have a quick scroll back through the comments um so duh, duh, duh. i think we th there we go so hypotics was saying i can finally get the very start of the stream and it's good to have you on board i love people who have more python knowledge than me because um i i know a lot about many languages but not not the depth that some people have who do this professionally so um, i'll know javascript and c and pascal and um, python java I'll, I'll have touched all these languages but python is probably the one that i've now got the most depth with visual basic as well visual basic.net and vba for applications and so on saturn was saying f10 tr f10 tr f10. <laughs> the logo ish Yes, logo. So one of the things I've got on the um, the GitHub repository for Smiles Lab is uh, making it logo compatible so that you could type in logo code and it would work. Because uh, I know there's a lot of cheating materials out there about logo. And for people who are thinking like, what the hell is logo? It's, um, they used to have these turtles, didn't they? That's what they called it. It's essentially like one of these robots, like a Smiles robot. And you could just make it move forwards and turn right and so on. That whole language was called logo. I think MSW logo is probably freeware for Windows. We used that when I was in education a long time ago. So Tom joined the stream. Awesome. Hey, Tom. And Calif um, says, thanks for the stream. Cheers. No problem. And is that Emmanuel? Is that how you pronounce your name? Immuvel. Im Immuvel. Jason Rest are a great combination. Very flexible. Absolutely. So Hypotics was saying you can call your system localhost. You absolutely can. I had a sign. I thought it's still there. It's a bit out of date now, but um, and, and, and it's a bit wiped off as well. But basically, stay at home and wear a mask. <laughs> and that was 127.0.0.1 because that's home. 
but you know that advice is way out of date now um so what else are people saying there so um ashkan's saying uh, can we have can we add a live camera on the background probably um i can add all kinds of cameras and things to this display i've got quite a few different setups i've got this main host camera i've got my overhead camera i've got um uh, GoPro, my speech is a bit out of sync if you can see there, when I speak it doesn't sort of sync up but you can see I've got the robot here just to my left, the overhead camera is just here and then I have another view which is kind of a combination of code, uh, the robot and me as well. So depending what I've got plugged in um, and then there's just like regular screenshots with me in the corner there. So I've got a few different options for cameras so hopefully that covers what you're after there. So many of you were saying about uh, CSS could handle that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, not familiar with CSS, but there is an app which can receive the data from an IP address. Uh, there's a, the data. Yeah, so any data that's been sent and received, um, you need you need to use um, REST for that, really. You need, you need some kind of jQuery, something like that. I mean, the web, the, the whole web is based on that protocol of get and put. That's how web pages are, are sought and how images that are in the web pages and any component is, uh, is is got for you. Flask is awesome. It really is. I've uh, I've got a book up there on uh, Flask. I don't know if you can see it on the back of my... I've got a little bookshelf and uh, I've got a book on, on Flask. Uh, and I did um, develop um, a, a quite a big application for that. It was going to be the SMARS learning platform um, that you could log into, uh, but I've not finished that yet. Uh, so um, Ashkan saying we can't receive the HD stream. That's weird. So if I just check on the stream um, health on YouTube Studio, um, what's it saying? Are you on Facebook or are you on YouTube? Um, because it says the data's fine, I think. <clears throat> Let me just wait for this to load up. Um, so there's like an analytics that tells you about the stream health and so on. And it looks good. I always make sure that I'm connected to my Ethernet as well, not my Wi-Fi, because that can always, that can sometimes make the stream a bit uh, jittery. So Hybotics was saying, rather than use global variables, wouldn't it be better to just return the telemetry? Yes, absolutely it would. Um, but I don't know why I brought the telemetry in in that way. But yeah, yeah, that would be a better option. And Python uses like pointers for everything, so it's not like you're returning like a massive chunk of stuff for it to to deal with. Yeah, and, and global variables are basically a bad idea. I would completely agree with that. So find it easier to add. And then there's a path there, user bin in Python 3, at the first line of your script, and then just add that permission to the script. Yeah, that's true. And then you can do script name to run the script. Yes, yes, this is all good bash and Z shell stuff. Um, so this was about the, uh, when we suggested <laughs> the Morse code stuff. So Adam is the guy who, thought of that. Um, so hypothesis that I am N NZPKT technician class. So I'm not sure what NZPKT is. I'm gonna have to look at that. <laughs> is that a, a radio ham thing? And then Amivo says uh, there might be actually a Python library uh, for Morse. There probably well is. Um, I just thought for the sake of typing it out, um, why not? <laughs> Um, so and then Rich says, come and get this tested. Yes, I can, you can type a certain string. Absolutely. Y you can play with this yourself. If you have a, a smart squad, you've got a Raspberry Pi Zero and you've got um, an internet connection, you can do all these things. <laughs> nice, beautiful. It is. It is. Isn't it so cool? I was so pleased when I got this working. Thank you, Adam, for even suggesting that. <laughs> When you say boo, it goes crazy and runs away. You could do that. So one of the cool things I've got with these robots, because they are Raspberry Pi Zero, not, not a Pico, uh, you can do an awful lot with these. You can do image recognition, you can do voice synthesis, voice recognition, object detection through image recognition and neural networks. And I have done some streams on that. I think one of them is actually corrupted and has gone away. So I might have to redo that one, but we can do speech recognition. So we can talk to our robot and ask it to move forward. That's definitely going to be um, another video, I think. So you can make it beep and code too. Microbit 2 can beep through its speaker. Absolutely. The microbit can do so many cool things. I, I do like that as a little chip. So that would be really cool, wouldn't it? So we just need to add a little uh, piezo buzzer. Um, and clap Morse code. Absolutely. <laughs> you can sort of like clap the, the code and it would recognize it. 
So yes, Smiles says. So I'm happy to be here. I've been using Python for robotics for over 10 years. That's awesome. That is amazing. So I've not been using it that long. Um, I was looking through to see when I started. So I started playing with Arduinos about eight years ago. Um, I've got a computer science degree, but we didn't use Python back then. It was um, C, C++, um, and, and some Java and JavaScript. JavaScript was new at the time. In fact, one of the books I have um, up there is JavaScript 1.2. It had just been renamed from LiveScript when, uh, when it was on Netscape Navigator. So Adam says, I've actually got a mint condition BBC Turtle sat on my workbench. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I want to see a picture of that. You've got to send me a picture of that. So the one with the translucent green shell comes from the um, emulator evaluation just, just stuck. Ah, I see. Yes, yes. Infrared. So I was thinking about, um, not infrared per se. Um, I'm just thinking I've got any to hand. On the line following module um, on the Smiles robot, um, that uses, um, it is infrared. It is infrared. It's got an infrared receiver and, and transmitter. It's like two LEDs. One receives and one transmits. And I was thinking about doing, you know, point to point infrared sending and receiving it's not very fast but you could get it to do something between the different robots and in fact the i have a lego robot that has a remote control and that's infrared because if you shine it away from it it stops moving um, so it doesn't use any kind of rf so watch your host camera the image looks fantastic so i joined um, a live streaming pros group um, they're called live streaming pros with loria petrucci and she taught me about how to do live streaming. So this is a Sony um, A6100 with a 16 millimeter f1.4 lens. Um, very expensive piece of kit, but you get this really nice depth of field. So I'm nice and sharp. The, the image in the background is blurred. If I sort of lean in a bit, um, you'll see that sharpens up a bit. And then if I hold something up, like, I don't know, this little remote control here, um, it's quite quick to do. Um, focusing and so on and very quiet as well so I take a HDMI feed from the camera and plug it into some software that's called Ecamm Ecamm Live so no wide foot clear dome is that the uh, the turtle so the request library it makes using the internet look very easy it really does doesn't it so that's what I like about the um, flask it makes everything really really simple that's what I like about Python actually it just makes everything just seem that much more achievable um, so Rich says, uh, the uh, the one we had at school had glowing green, glowing red eyes and looked like a turtle. It brings back memories. So I used to work in a school about 16 years ago, and we had all that kind of kit. Um, they, they had a broken one, if I remember. I don't think they'd actually had it working for quite some time. You could stick a pen in it and it would draw shapes and things, but um, yeah, it wasn't great. Ah, yes. So my dad used to be a radio ham. He, I can't remember what his call sign was. He used to laugh. There was a guy who had a motorbike who had his um, um, his radio ham radio on his motorbike and he would say motorbike mobile and then give his call sign. So yeah, my dad used to sort of, as he was driving home, before we had mobile phones, when he was about um, 10 miles away, he could sort of click on his radio and say like, I'm, I'm on my way home, put the kettle on or I'll get my tea ready. <laughs> and we would sort of hear that through the, uh, through the speaker. We had a great big antenna on the side of the house and we were in quite a high up position so it, it did travel quite far. I had a CB radio back in the day but um, yeah that wasn't great really. So only seen um, green turtle in the books. Awesome. <laughs> Everybody's feeling old now. <laughs> so just like playing with object recognition on an NVIDIA Jetson Nano. So I've heard a lot about that I mean, it must be quite straightforward to do on there. So I've certainly trained um, a few neural networks on how to do image detection. Um, I did a show on that as well a while back. Um, it's essentially just looks at things, converts things to grayscale, and then takes the image as like an array of inputs into a neural network, and then you just train it to recognize things, and it figures it out from there. Well, the training cycle is the thing that takes a long time to do. Now, you can do um, training on the modern ones, like the Raspberry Pi Pico. They've got like a little machine learning optimized library in there, part of, the, part of the, um, the silicon is optimized for that otherwise it does take a long time so i trained um, a raspberry pi camera to detect birds at a bird table and classify which type of bird was there and how many and count them um, and it took three days on a macbook pro to train that using tensorflow uh, but that was a couple of years ago that i did that so i don't feel as old today <laughs> to sleep uh rich smiling at that 
So yes, you're definitely going to dig out a, a picture of that. So Hypotix says, I've worked in C, C++, uh, but now I shudder when I consider working with them. And I use CircuitPython and MicroPython for my robotics. And I, I found the same thing. I remember coming across MicroPython um, before it was quite popular, certainly before it was on the Pico, before that had even been launched. Um, I installed it on an ESP32 and an ESP8266 and got it working on there. And I was like, this is amazing. So you've got the ease of use, the beauty of code of Python on an embedded device. This is the way forward. And luckily, everybody else has thought so too and had made it happen. So Adafruit have done a great job with CircuitPython. It's not to my taste personally because it's um, it's kind of a, a fork away from MicroPython. Um, but yeah, it does work with all their, their boards. So uh, yes, the focus on the spot, it, it, absolutely yes. So the, spoke, the focusing is really good on this camera. Um, I've also got quite a, a complicated lighting setup. You can probably just about see I've got a ring light next to me here. That's called a hair light, which is quite ironic because I'm almost bald. Um, but that shines light on my shoulder and separates me from the background. I then got a great big light up here, which is a, an Elgato key light. Sorry, just bang the microphone then. So that shines on my face. I've then got another light, another ring light just over here. Um, so you have to have two lights, one that's like main light and one slightly darker, but only just, just to give you a bit of definition. Um, so they will light me nicely. If I turn them off, it makes such a big difference. If I turn off this light here, um, all of a sudden my, the image looks quite flat. And I'll, that, that side light, now you can see on the side of my face is lighting that. Um, I'll pull that back on. It goes quite bright for a second and then adjusts itself. So yes, you need a, uh, you need an expensive setup if you're going to do live streaming. Um, I'm not joking. So um, and then I've got the um, Blue Yeti Nano mic as well, which is a good entry level mic. So Hypotix is saying, um, have you tried the um, Adafruit Braincraft hat with a Raspberry Pi? I've not tried that. I do have a Raspberry Pi. Um, I've got a number of them actually. So on that back wall there, there's two just mounted there. There's one that's on the desk over here, that black one, just there. There's one that drives the um, the printer, which is just over here that's running Octopi. There's another one under the desk there. And I think I've got a drawer full of them too. So there's a, there's a number of Raspberry Pis going on here. <laughs> I used to be a wheelchair mobile, but not now. What? <laughs> ESP32, absolutely yes, that for the win. Um, they're very good tutorials by Invida for all kinds of a AR things, awesome. So is JSON limited to what it can be handled, e.g. text, or could it set an image? So you can do binary stuff over JSON as well, you just encode it um, and then send it off and then it can unpack. It might not be the most efficient way to do that. JSON is one of those, if you think about why do we have, why have certain standards stuck? Um, and it's because they're, they, 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 they are that nice balance between human readable and machine readable. So JSON is very human readable in its structure. Um, so you can handcraft it if you needed to, uh, and you don't get, it's not overly complicated to do that. Whereas something like XML is like horrific to use if you need to do that manually. Everything's like very case sensitive and very strict and formal um, and isn't really human readable, even though a push you can probably just about read it, but you need special tools to read it. Um, if you put it in your browser, I think it might format it, but um, you need something to like, you know, Notepad++ plus plus to be able to read that. Whereas JSON, everything reads that. It's nice and lightweight and simple, and you can, you can minify it. You can just crunch all the white space out of it, and it'll still work. But it's just not as pretty to do that. So that's one of the reasons it's stuck, is it's, it's that nice balance between human readable and machine readable and efficient. Um, YAML is the same. If you've ever looked at YAML for doing like configuration files, it's nice and simple, nice... You know, the structure is defined by spaces and, and dashes and things. It's just nice and easy to use. So that that's easier to use than sort of a hard binary format where it's this, this number of bytes is something and this number of bytes. Machines like that kind of stuff, but humans hate it. So um, you can use it to send images, but it's probably not the most efficient. It's probably just best to send the image as it is. Um, so ESP32 could probably run micro probably run it with MicroPython, run it, run what, machine learning? Probably. So I recently turned 63, awesome. And I uh, could not agree more about Python, Python on microcontrollers. Absolutely. So Rich says, no, Jason is the only text uh, through key value pairs, but requests in Python can do post images. Yeah, you can do, you can encode it as a big, big block of text, but it's, um, it's not recommended to do that because images are like massive normally compared to text. It is really designed for text. 
Uh, oh, okay, uh, thanks. I was going to suggest using a Pico in the bot and then sending data to an RP4 and let it do the major processing. You could still do that kind of thing and just have it as like a remote device. And that's why I've separated the libraries out so you can do a lot of the stuff separately from each other. So you could have the uh, Smiles library running on one thing and you know the user interface and Flask running on another thing and then the robot itself could be you know micro bit doing something else. So you could separate all these things out if you wanted to. So nowadays, a um, current gen mobile phone is more capable of uh, good live streams. Absolutely. So that's one of the things that um, we were taught. You don't have to wait until you've got really expensive stuff to go live. You, you can just do it from a mobile phone. Uh, and in fact, they have like this uh, challenge every April and August. They call Live Every Day Leader. Um, so you have to go live every single day in August and April and you start using your mobile phone just to sort of get a lot of people are very uncomfortable on camera, don't like hearing their own voice, don't like looking at making eye contact with a camera and so on. And they get very nervous. There's a thing called the live adrenaline monster, LAM, which when you're you're performing, you're hosting the show, you forget everything, you think, Ugh. so I have my notes just on uh, just to my left, my right here, just so I can remember what I need to say and what I need to cover off. Um, so Jason rocks for transferring information between machines and humans. Tiny Pico runs MicroPython. Tiny Pico runs MicroPython. Absolutely, I'm just saying. Started to use the CAN bus. How to use the CAN bus? I've not used that yet. I'm not sure what that is. The CAN bus. I'm not familiar with that. So yeah, there's a whole load of chips out there. I mean, the um, the new Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect. That's got so many cool things in it. That answers one of the questions. That show that I did about securing your mic your MicroPython device. So one of the massive flaws, if you like, at the moment is all these embedded systems that like Raspberry Pi Picos and so on, you're storing your source code on the device. If anybody picks that, they you know it's got like a Wi-Fi connection on it. They can read your Wi-Fi password and your username straight off that device. There's no encryption on it. There's no way to hide that. Whereas with the Arduino Nano 2040 Connect, you can do that. There's a crypto chip. So, ah, so the CAN bus is used in the automotive industry. I see. Yes, that's the thing that connects to your, there's always like a thing underneath the dashboard, isn't it? You can plug your computer in and make your car do all the things it needs to do. So I've got an electric car. I can actually program it to do things like charge and what else can I do over an API. So Renault have got really quite open API for for doing stuff so the app that they have is just a web page and if you know your if you just send your credentials you can actually just hack their api and make your car do stuff you can't drive it but you can uh, you can make it do things like charge and so on so do you have a schedule for your streams of how i could find it so yes if you head over to smilesfan.com let me show you this let me just uh, bring this up on here if you go to smilesfan.com, um, let me see if I can find it. And then I think it's under About Us link in bio. There's lots of the current videos there. Now I did used to have a show schedule. Now where did I put that? Um, where did I put that? I've just been moving things about on the site to try and make it a bit easier to use. And now I can't find the stuff I need to find on there. Um, so if I go to play, is it on there? I don't think it's on there. Was it not on the about us? Or oh, is Mars? Da, da, da. There is like a show schedule on one of these pages. Um, maybe it was under the videos one. Now oh, this is really poor. I should be able to find that straight off. <laughs> Let's just go for join our live streams. No, it's just going to go straight there. So basically I go live. This is a good opportunity for me to say every single Sunday I will go live around seven o'clock British summertime or Greenwich Mean Time, whichever we're currently in the current season. That doesn't help if you're watching this on replay. I appreciate, but it's around about that time for the live streams. There are all the different time zones, so depending where you are. So if you're in um, India or Pakistan, it's around 12.30 a.m., in the morning sorry <laughs> i know you're like five and a half hours five hours ahead if you're in uh, the americas you're in the sort of back end of the day i guess whereas um, if you're in australia in china it's very early in the morning as well so that's just if you want to join the live stream um, if you want to go to the smilesfan.com, that's the source of all information about Smiles robots, which is just the best robots in the world. Uh, I'm constantly updating that. I'm currently building out a new course uh, that I'll be launching soon on there, another free course, um, 
which is how to code in Arduino for the SMARS. And it's essentially some of these libraries that we've already, these lessons that are just on screen here at the moment, um, but in the new learning platform. Um, so that's um, smilesfan.com. Then there's also, if you want to help out the show, you can go to buymeacoffee.com. Uh, you can also find on there some of the cheat sheets and some of the um, the nice uh, posters that I can show you on my wall in a second. Uh, and that helps pay for all this expensive equipment that we've just talked about. So the lighting, the royalty-free music, the graphics software, the streaming software, the equipment, and so on. And obviously all the Arduinos and Raspberry Pis that I have to get just to make the show interesting. <laughs> so if you want to help me out, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash kevinmacleer and you can buy me a coffee on there. Um, so that's that. And if you like the video, then you can obviously subscribe. You can hit the like button right now if you're on Facebook or if you're on YouTube, both of them count um, towards the algorithm sort of identify that you like this content and I should produce more of it. And, and I do build robots. <laughs> so if you want to do that, that can help me out too. So that's how you can find um, the show schedule. <laughs> there is one, uh, I'll, I'll dig it out and I'll put a link to it on there as well. Uh, but essentially, if you look through um, the YouTube channel, you can see what videos I've done in the past. They are organized by playlists so that common um, things such as, if I just go back to that view there. So if I go to the playlists, you can see we have um, Python ones, MicroPython ones, we have Raspberry Pi Pico for beginners, we've got Microbit robots, build your own AI, which I've only done one of so far. Um, what else have we got? Auto DIY, Raspberry Pi Pico and OpenCat. Uh, fun with SMARS is quite a few on there. Building the quad robot in Move, getting started with robotics, uh, and then learning Python for robotics. So that's a bit of a tutorial on how to do Python. You can see that I've been looking at some uh, Python stuff there too. So um, what else have we got? Some more comments there. Hang on. Do, 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 do. So, um, have you thought of any implementing something for MQTT if that's all the rage? We've done a show on that. So we've done a show on um, um, MQTT and Node-RED. So we did MQTT for um, a couple of different projects. Let me find that one for you uh, and I'll be able to show you the link for that. So Node-RED. We should search the channel there for Node-RED. So I've created a weather bot, which is this little guy here. So Weatherbot um, is a little robot. He's holding his little weather sensor there. Uh, he's got a little weather readout, which is just um, a servo and a temperature gauge there. Uh, and he actually sends his data. He's using an ESP8266 um, or ESP32, connects to the Wi-Fi, sends the data up to my MQTT server, and then I can do some nice dashboards. So if you want to look at that show, that's called Weatherbot. Uh, and then I also did one about Node-RED home automation, MQTT, quite a long show. It's like nearly an hour and a half long, um, but there we go. I think I might have also touched on uh, MQTT in that show as well, MicroPython and Wi-Fi. So yes, this is the thing, have you done like shows for nearly a year now? I think um, next month, so in a couple of, only a couple of days time, a couple of weeks time, well, we can have a, a, a celebratory birthday because uh, we've been going for a year. So Adafruit come out with the Feather M4 CAN board. Um, I have two of them and we need to finish soldering the headers to them. So yes, the one-eyed <laughs> the one-eyed penguin. So I, I spent quite a while like trying to figure out what would be the best kind of look for this guy and uh, this is what I came up with. I wanted it to look quite cute. It looks a bit like a minion and I don't really like minions but um, it does look quite cute. So you can see there he's got like a, a little dash dashboard it says Weatherbot in sort of a nice font there. And he's holding his little sensor in his hand there that does sort of detach. It's just a little, uh, what they call DHT22, I think that is. It can do, um, not pressure, it can do humidity and temperature. And that connects straight to the back there, which is just a, I think like a node MCU, something like that. Very simple to get working. Yeah, and he sends his data up. In fact, if I pull his head off there, you can see there's just a little servo inside um, just connects to that front there. Very, very simple to get working. And the files for this are also on um, Thingiverse. They don't seem to index them very well, though. So if you look in the show notes, you can find the link to that. I struggle to get him back together there. <laughs> so yeah, it needs some googly eyes for sure. I was thinking about maybe putting like... I don't know, an LED or a camera or something in there. Um, maybe the camera from the ESP32. I 
got one of the ESP32 camera modules somewhere. I've not played with that very much yet, but I've bought it. I think I did get it working just to see that it you can get data streamed from it, video data. Um, but yeah, that's probably for another time. So we've been going for like nearly an hour and a half now, actually. Um, I think we're, we're pretty much done there. So we've been through what Smars Lab is, what you can get it to do, some cool things like Morse code, getting the robot to tap stuff out. There's so many cool things you can expand that with. And I've shown you some of the technologies that have been involved in that. So if you want to know any more about those specific things like Flask or um, API, creating APIs or Bootstrap, any of those kinds of things, let me know in the comments and I'll do uh, a bit more of an in-depth on one of them. So thanks for watching along with me today. really enjoyed your company. I uh, really do enjoy like reading the comments and stuff like that. Um, so um, is it Veluvula? Is that how you pronounce your name? Veluvola? Veluvolu. Veluvolu. I'm terrible at names, I'm sorry. Uh, looking ahead to more ESP32 MicroPython stuff. Absolutely. Yep, there's definitely more of that to come. Thanks, Richard, and thanks everybody for watching. So I shall see you next time. <laughs>